going guys? Nick here with Tierra Permaculture. This is Otto. It's a beautiful morning this morning. It's going to be another sunny day, sunny and dry. Lots of wind the past couple of days. Um, all these kind of lead, especially in the tropics, to usually a pretty ne big need for water if you don't have your systems set up correctly. Uh, so today I'm going to show you a few permaculture design strategies that can help with that, especially if you're in the tropics. A couple things you can do. We're talking about three basic things today, and uh, and then from there we'll kind of move on. I think I'll end up having this as a regular a regular uh, show or a regular regular topic on the vlog is tropical tropical permaculture design strategies. So today we're going to be talking about mulching, creating high shade to help with that intense sun in the middle of the day. And then we're going to talk about the chickens and why chickens are so valuable to have in the tropics. So let's get going. Ready? You ready? Ah! 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 Alright. I gotta go. I gotta go. Alright, so we actually get to talk about both or two of those topics in one place today. So this garden under here, we're actually protected by this banana tree right here. And this banana tree is essentially providing that high shade. So in this specific instance, I actually have a fence here that's also kind of covered up and with vines and everything. So it's actually protecting from that morning sun too, hitting this garden bed down here. So what I could actually do is remove a lot of these vines and then I'm gonna be getting that sun because right now I'm probably gonna blind you, but the sun is straight up, straight up right where you are now. This is, this is the east over here. So it kind of rises up this way comes up in the air, straight up over our house, and then it sets over there in the west. So that's kind of our sun path. Now that's really important to know in permaculture design is you gotta know your sectors. You gotta know how energy enters and exits your property. So for me, I get a lot of sun, especially for this garden, my sun basically starts around here when it gets super high and then when it comes down over here, this is my kind of sun sector for this garden right here. So I have to think about that in my design. So if I take out these leaves right here, <clears throat> especially the ones right above it, that intense midday sun, which is usually like right, you know, between 10 and two, nine and three, somewhere in between those hours, right? That intense sun is gonna be hitting right at my plants. And that's a lot of times what causes a lot of heat stress here in the tropics. So that's something to keep in mind, having high shade of some sort. Luckily in the tropics, we have so many, uh, so many plants that have no major branches. So bananas being one of them, you can see a nice big rack here. This thing's getting ready to want to be harvested pretty soon. And there's no branches on this banana stalk. So you can actually have it growing straight up your garden and create that high shade without actually being in your way. The only problem or problem, the only thing to think about is that when you have the banana flowering actively, as you can see here, so this is a banana flower. When you have the banana flowering actively, you're going to end up getting this kind of banana litter falling. So you just want to keep that in mind with whatever you're working on is if you end up with bananas above you and it's flowering, you're probably going to have some uh, some banana flowers falling. But these are high in potassium, so as it breaks down, it's going to add uh, available potassium to your soil as the, as the microbes break it down. Uh, another great tree to use for this in the tropics is papaya, which uh, if you have not seen my backyard yet, you'll know that I have a lot of papaya. And look at this one. This one's starting now to want to flower little flower buds. So this looks like it's going to be a male tree. It does not surprise me. I get so many males here. Uh, and you can tell that based on the flower itself. So um, if you have a flower that's sticking out like this, see how there's that long stalk there and there's a bunch of flower buds? That is the male flower. The female flower sits right at the base of each one of these little intersections. It'll sit right there and open up right here versus the males will come out and then open up. Uh, I've heard that papayas can be hermaphroditic, meaning that they can have both male and female gene expressions. I get to actually prove that, but I've been told that if you do have a male, if you cut it down or, or cut it at opposite, basically cut it at a height, 
and it'll regrow. If it does have that female uh, gene expression, then it'll actually grow back that new stem as a female. This is just here tell. I cannot confirm this as of yet, but if I do ever confirm it, I will definitely let you guys know because it's very fascinating to me. But back to this, so papaya, another great high shade again, because you do have all these, these leaves, right? But they're so easy to break off. You can just break them off just like that. You can cut them right at the stem there. And then this just becomes mulch for your garden. You throw it right on down there. So you have both a mulch producer and a high shade. So this is a good strategy. And these two papayas that are in this garden, or really there's, there's three of them, but I'll end up only having two likely see which ones are the females because um, the females are the ones that produce fruit the males don't produce the fruit so that's why I'm looking for the females oh. I take care of this auto listen this is why I know you're playing listen right here right where that right there that that's a uh, that's a garden bed you don't want to step there bud this is also a garden area that's the garden area. You can't go there, okay? Otto loves to play, as you might see him running all over the place. But some mornings he's very playful, and uh, that can sometimes be, be a problem as I'm walking around and working in the garden and showing you guys things, because he likes to jump in. I have to keep reminding him over and over again, don't go in the garden, Otto. But he'll learn one day, maybe. So, here he is over here. He's thinking about his next move. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about high shade. High shade is good because basically that sun from nine to three in the tropics, very, very hot and has the potential to dry up your soils and cause heat stress. So if you can shade it, or at least have part shade from nine to three palms, that's the other one that I didn't talk about now. Palms are another great high shade, but they're more long-term. So once you get them set up, so you see my, we have our coconut palm here. There's no branches on palms. Basically any tree that has no branches works great as high shade. Palms are especially great because they have that nice kind of wispy open leaf structure. So as, it, as they, uh, once they get tall enough, now when you first start palms, they're really big and bulky and close to the ground. And it's hard to work around, but then after you get them established and they're, you know, at least six feet high, super easy to garden underneath and I'll actually show you that in a, in a different video when I'm up in Hacienda Rosa which I can start going to now because we just ended our quarantine all right back to this so mulching is number two so the soil food web this is I've talked about this a lot but it's actually the soil microbes in the soil that are responsible for cycling nutrients for your plants and now there's a lot of scientific research on that I'm happy to give you some more of that if you guys want it let me know but this is it's the soil microbes. It's the bacteria, fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the ciliates, all that that are in the soil itself. That's what's actually cycling nutrients. So tropical soils, especially like the top soils, tend to be lacking in things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's what we'll talk about that a little bit in, uh, in the section on the chickens up next. But for now, by adding mulch to your soil, if you actually have the, the food web, the actual full soil food web and all the microbes in the soil, they'll actually cycle those nutrients for you because they are in the parent material. They're gonna be in, your, in whatever your base soil is, whatever your base sand, silt, clay mix is. The available nutrients are there. They just cannot be processed by the plant without the soil food web. So it's all about protecting the soil, which is what mulching is for. Mulching also helps, helps with uh, water retention within the soil and it also helps uh, uh, help with the rain especially here in the tropics heavy heavy rains um, can cause impacts onto the soil which actually causes com compaction it may not seem like the rain itself will cause a compaction but it actually causes compaction pretty deep in the soil with those raindrops hitting so adding mulch to your garden is actually going to help protect it from that heavy rain and in the tropics that can be a very important thing so i actually just added a lot of this yesterday so I usually just start with uh, sugar cane. I use a lot of sugar cane leaves as my mulch here on my gardens because, oh, one second guys, auto, auto, auto. Oh yeah, I run right through the garden. That's exactly what I want you to do. <laughs> Listen, you can't go in the garden. No going in the garden. I know you're so excited, you're a little tail wagon. 
but no guard. He thinks I want to play. He thinks I want to play with him. I don't want to play right now. I know it's hard to be mad at you because you're so cute. All right, so back to mulching here. I use sugarcane a lot because I have a lot. I have a sugarcane uh, plant over there. You can see it in the background there, right there. So that produces a lot of bulk material that I can use for my mulch. And so I like to use that here because it it's high in silica and it takes a long time to break down. Here in the tropics, I appreciate that. In the temperate climate, maybe not so much, but in, in the tropics, I appreciate that. The other thing I'm using that I just added, and I actually learned this from Centropic Agriculture. If, you, if you're interested in that, I'll try to leave a couple links in the description below uh, in the show notes um, for you to look into. I actually just talked with, uh, with uh, one of my friends, Roger, yesterday, who's pretty big into the Centropic world and actually has put out a guidebook on how to do it. So if you're interested, I'll make sure I leave that linked below. Um, but I actually learned this banana trick. So these are the banana stalks. So it's not this specific banana, and I actually don't think it's a banana. I think it's actually something in the same family. I'll show you where I got it. But this here, super high in potassium, super bulky, nice bulky mulch, and it's really wet. If you ever opened up a banana before in your life, you'll know that when you slice these open, you see little drops of water and little dribbles of, of all the nutrient that's in there. And, by throwing it down here, I'm helping protect the soil with this nice big bulky thing. Right underneath here, all as this thing starts to decompose, it's gonna give lots of moisture right to the roots of the soil here in the tropics. And it's gonna protect me from, I mean, weeds growing also. Mulch is another great thing to help prevent your weeds, the stuff you don't want growing uh, in your garden because once you have your, your plants established that you want growing and you mulch around it, it makes it harder for those weeds to pop up. Now again, weeds, a plant, where you do not want it. There's no such thing as a weed. That's just how we call them because we want to be in control of the garden even though we can't be in control of the garden. So I'm using these, uh, this banana cut up. I basically just took the stalk and I split it in half with a machete and then chopped it up into small bits and put it in here. And I think it's gonna work really well. I'm excited to try it out. I've actually never tried banana uh, trunks as a, as a mulch before. So I'm really excited to see how it works, but I've heard really good things about this in the tropics. So that often, because this is often a waste material, it's not waste per se, but when, once the bananas are done producing, so once this, this rack is done, this tree will no longer produce. It's done. It only produces one crop per tree. So we then have to cut that down and we can use that. We can basically just leave it there to rot or throw it in with the chickens, or you can cut it up just like I did and use it as mulch. It's going to be high in potassium. Bananas are high in potassium, so that's good. That's something that the plants need a lot of. The other two things lacking, nitrogen and phosphorus. And hey, guess what, guys? That's what the chickens can help you with. So let's move on over to them next. Quick stop in the flower garden. There's a little baby avocado here and a bunch of little cosmos flowers coming up. And these are here to attract beneficial insects and pollinators, and it's like a little spot for them to be happy. We got some uh, zinnias that are starting to, they're probably gonna be flowering somewhat soon. We do have some nasturtium in there, although I have yet to see nasturtium do well on my property. I keep planting it because I would love it to grow well. It has an edible flower, it's edible petals. These guys right here look kind of like lily pads. I really enjoy them and I, I want them to produce, but so far, not so much. On to the chickens. Chickens are a great asset in the tropics because they will essentially take a lot of your food scraps. They'll take food scraps, excess organic material, anything that you think you might not want or might not need and turn it into a product called compost, if you manage the system correctly, that's gonna add all the beneficial microbes into your soil. Additionally, hey mama. Additionally, the, uh, the feathers and the various other byproducts of the hens and the, and the roosters, any chickens really, any poultry, um, are really high in phosphorus. Now that's, that's, a, that's a nutrient that tends to be fairly lacking in tropical topsoils. 
again, if we, if we have a full soil food web, the nutrient cycling is going to be there and it's going to happen. But if, if you don't, by adding compost that is high in chicken materials, you're actually going to be adding phosphorus to your soil. Chicken manure is high in nitrogen. Pretty much any manure is high in nitrogen. But chicken manure especially, nice and high and rich in nitrogen. So nitrogen plus phosphorus. And then if you recycle their eggshells and crush up their eggshells and add that back into your kind of chicken compost uh, kick down compost system, then you're also going to be adding calcium in there. And calcium is really good in tropical clays if you don't have it in the right proportions to create flo flocculation in your clay, which essentially allows the clay to drain much better and to, and to have a little bit more structure, which is really important here in the tropics. So you can see here, I use, uh, right now you can't see it because the compost pile is now completely uh, essentially spread out, but I use this little small little run here uh, this is about six feet wide by about, um, I don't know, maybe 20 feet long, maybe a little bit less than that. And I use this area to have my compost piles. So I use a, a uh, it's kind of called a chicken tractor composting system. Uh, this is really heavily featured in Jeff Lawton's work, and I can try to link to that here. And it's also very similar to a few different systems that Justin Rhodes does. I'll also link to him. But when this was an actual pile and a compost pile, it was nice and tall. Right now they have spread it out to the point, and I've actually harvested from this quite a few times already. So I'll probably do one more small harvest, and then I'm going to rebuild a new pile. And when I do that, I'll make sure I, I show you guys to, to see how it's done. But... What's nice about having chickens in like an established pen is anything that you don't want in your garden, all those weeds, you can just throw, if it's right near your garden, you can throw it right over the fence, whoop, right into here. And then these chickens will eat that. So you're feeding your chickens with that, with your weeds. You can also feed them all your food scraps. You can feed them, you can feed them, you can grow food for them. I'm growing sunflowers, so I have seed to give them. But there's often a lot of food already on your property that you don't even know of that can be feeding these chickens. And if you want a little bit more info on that, you can check out my video from yesterday. I'll, I'll link it in a little, a little card above that uh, talks about feeding your chickens using scraps and weeds and things that are growing around your garden. So check that out, I'll link it above. Um, but chickens, in, in my opinion, is one of the best things to have on any sort of tropical permaculture homestead or farm or or anything else that you're doing growing food in the tropics because the benefits of having them is just just outweigh so much you also get the byproducts of eggs most people like eggs most people want to buy eggs so that's a market if you do if you want to do a lot of chickens you can end up doing meat production um, I'm personally a vegetarian, but I do eat meat if I know where it came from. So if I'm growing that meat, I will eat that meat. So this mama here, she's, she's my, this is my mama. She can see she likes to cuddle up. She puts her, her head across my arm or my leg and she just sits there and cuddles up. They're also, they, they can be pets. Chickens can be pets, absolutely. I know it sounds crazy. They're farm animals. We actually don't name our chickens just because I, I do recognize that they are. They are kind of farm animals and at some point we might lose them or we might need to harvest them. So I personally don't like to name my chickens, but if you have them for a long time, you can, you can name them, especially the hens, because we're not going to harvest the hens because the hens are going to give us eggs for at least two or three years. Typically the, the, the main production cycle for the hens is for, for two or three years, you're going to get some regular egg production. After that, it drops about 50%. So right now we get an egg a day from each of these mamas. So we get two eggs. We want more hens, and we've been hoping that they would want to sit on eggs so that we can get more hens without having to buy them and not having to raise them personally. But chickens, definitely a huge benefit to your system. Uh, you can also have them range through your gardens if you have a little more of a long-term garden like, uh, like sweet potatoes or anything like that. You can actually have them w wander through there and pick out any of the little insects that might be trying to cause devastation to your plants. And uh, yeah, they're just fun to have. They're fun to have. I, I personally like a rooster. You might be seeing him right in the camera right now. He's right next to it. I like to have a rooster because the rooster does a job of protecting 
the hens. He'll be constantly looking up at the skies. Here, the only real major predator we have for chickens is the red-tailed hawk. Uh, we do have Puerto Rican boas, which can eat the, the babies, but not so much the big ones. So, um, yeah, the, that's the main predator. So that rooster, his eyes, con his, his head's constantly on a swivel looking up at the sky. And anytime he sees any sort of uh, bird of prey flying around, he makes a very specific call. And then the mamas know that they should go hide. And they'll actually instantly, you'll hear the call and you'll see the mamas run instantly. So he's protecting my flock for me. So I don't have to do it all the time. Oh, mama. So if you're interested more in that chicken composting system, I am going to do a video about that in the future, like just on I'm building the compost and then we'll track it through time. So I'm going to show you all that as the vlog goes on. So please like and subscribe if you do like what I'm doing here and you'll see much more of that. Uh, turn on the notifications if you are a subscriber because that means anytime I produce a new video, you'll actually get a little alert in your email or in whatever way you, uh, you choose to get notified that you can see you see, oh, there's a new video out. So my plan is to try to do this vlog daily for you guys and try to keep updating you on all the work that I'm doing so you can see see what I'm up to. The reality is I probably won't be able to do it every single day, but I'm gonna try to start with it daily just to get my rhythm going and then we'll kind of see where it progresses from there. So we'll have much more on chickens in the future for your tropical homestead, but uh, I just, chickens are, very very valuable in so many different ways and they if you set up the systems correctly they can be producing compost for you and all you really have to do is is turn the pile once a week and make sure they have food uh, but luckily as the compost matures it starts producing food for the hens and for the roosters because all the microbiota that's in that compost they love to eat all that stuff so as the compost matures it starts becoming food for them and that's why down here there's not a pile anymore because they've been scratching through it because they want to find all those little microbes in the soil so basically the three things we went over today is in the tropics high shade to protect you from that really harsh sun from 9 p 9 a.m to 3 p.m after that those angles a little bit less harsh the one exception i'd say is if you're if you're a west facing slope in the tropics you might be you might want to think about that in terms of when the sun comes in in the west because that can be really hot the western tropical sun can be very very hot so just kind of keep that in mind when you're planning your garden and really th in the tropic especially know your sun path know your sun path so you can plan that high shade to help protect your your garden beds directly below what's really great and and i mentioned it before centropic agricultural or sorry centropic agriculture or uh or agroforestry, that is a really, really good system to apply in the tropics because you're constantly having production and you're actually adding this forest layer, which in the tropics is really important for stability. So I definitely advocate for agroforestry or including trees in your system as I'm doing here with the papayas especially. Papayas, bananas, moringa right above me, palms, those are all really good for a, or a home garden. Banana, papaya, palm, those three have no branches so you can actually work underneath them without any problem and you're getting production from them really really great trees to include in any sort of tropical permaculture system all right mom i'm gonna get i'm gonna go now i know you're so comfortable i didn't want to get up this whole time but it's time she likes it when she cuddles up like that she feels safe she, she gets really close you can see she's pushing into my body and she's just kind of feeling nice and safe and and nestled and she really likes that all right well, you want a little attention too, Mama? You want a little attention? This mom and I had a little bit of time yesterday. It's funny, once you get to know them and they know you, these chickens, they'll, they'll come up to you like this. You can clean their beaks off. I like to clean their beaks off so they don't have stuff all over them. And you, you just check them. They check in with you. They'll actually walk up to me sometimes. They'll be like, ooh, something's wrong with you. This mama, let's take a look at it. Oh, sorry, Mama. I know, I don't, you don't like it when I do this. This mama actually got hurt. Oh, there it is. She actually got sliced by one of our previous roosters and, and it kind of ripped her, her skin away from the muscle. It was a pretty bad wound, but I basically, every day I came out here, I gave her some, uh, some Neosporin or something similar. And I just made sure she, she had what she needed. I cleaned the wound a few times and she's back to normal. Chickens are really resilient. Even if they do get attacked, I've seen a, a chicken have its, have its wing eaten off by a raccoon and then still live a very fulfilling life. Um, so chickens are resilient. You can handle chickens. If you're thinking about, oh, I don't think I can deal with chickens, you can do it, ch deal with chickens. And I can help you do that. 
So I'm gonna show you one more thing before we end this, uh, end this vlog today. Uh, yesterday, I was cleaning out the bottom part of my property here because it just needed it, it was time. And uh, we actually found, or I found, a volunteer calabaza. This is a pumpkin. This is the kind of the native pumpkin that grows here in, in, the, in Puerto Rico. It's very popular. And you can see there's the male flowers down there. I thought that this was just a male plant. I thought these plants were male or female, but uh, this vine is producing, I see other male plant, any other male flowers, and obviously it does have a pumpkin on. So I'm gonna be watching that. I also cleared out this area, which I'd actually never seen before. Um, and this is where I harvested those trunks that I used up in that upper garden. So you can actually use whatever's growing in your property as your mulch. And that's something I'm actually gonna be doing with this big old pile. So this pile right here, this is all this overgrowth that I cut. And it's a mixture of grassy material and leaf material. And this is perfect for a compost starter. And if I actually had all the bulk material I needed to make a compost, I would start one. And next time I do have enough bulk material to make a compost, I will be starting one and I will be showing you how I do that. So you guys can try to do the same thing on your property. But these, this green stuff came from this kind of decorative tree here. And I just kind of pruned it back and to clean it up a little bit. And all of this other growth is just stuff that was down in the drainage ditch that I cleared a little bit. So it's much cleaner down here now. I don't think I actually showed you the difference here, but before it was pretty much overgrown and now you can actually go through it. I also cleaned up up on there above the septic tank. There's a bunch of overgrowth there. So I grabbed all that. So basically I'm taking all these weeds instead of just throwing them on the ground like you could in a chop and drop system. I'm gathering them to use as bedding for my chickens. So this bedding I'm gonna put right underneath uh, pretty much anywhere where there's bare soil in the coop, but also right underneath uh, where they sleep at night. And that's gonna have all their manure drop onto it. And then it's gonna start breaking it down. And as this dries out and the manure gets added to it, it's gonna make a nice mixture to start my compost pile and be really successful with that. All right, final thing here, guys, I'm gonna show you. Yesterday I was talking about that little, uh, what I thought was a bitter melon or bitter gourd. I think is what I call it, bitter melon, bitter gourd. Uh, cun de amor, that's what they call it here, cun de amor. So did a little bit of research and I'm, I'm, I'm letting you guys know this because I want you to, to, if you do have questions about what I'm working on or what I'm, the things that I'm trying to learn about, thank you Gino for letting me know what this is. So this vine here produces these, so you can see there's a baby one right there. Um, they produce these orange fruits, and I did feature them yesterday in, in yesterday's vlog, so you can check it out there. But the leaves actually, if you make them, make them into a tea, they actually help with diabetes, which is really cool. So this is actually a medicinal plant that grows wild and is both a chicken feed and a feed for me. These, these leaves are edible, you can eat them. So it's about learning, it's very bitter. Ooh, usually bitter things are really good for you, but Wow, that is bitter. Glad you got to experience me eating that. Woo, I wouldn't eat it directly, but put it into a tea. Apparently it's really good to help you with, uh, if you have diabetes, you put three leaves in a tea and drink it a couple times a day. Apparently it's supposed to be really good for diabetes. Check it out, do your own research. It's called Cun de Amor, C-U-N-D-E-A-M-O-R in Spanish. And it's called Bitter Gourd or Bitter Melon in English, and I'm sure there's a lot of different varieties there, so hard for me to tell you exactly what, uh, which one to choose. So, that we're about to wrap up. I'm just gonna show you, cause I'm really excited about it. Stripe Roma tomato, you could probably harvest it now. I'm just trying to give it a little bit more time to get a little more delicious juices and sugar in it. And I'm really excited to harvest that. And you can see Otto, as usual, following me around the garden usually within about that far from me. If I'm in the garden, he likes to run around and be really close, which sometimes causes problems as he gets into the, into the gardens. Ooh, I'm still recovering from that. I definitely see why I call it bitter, bitter gourd. It's very bitter.
or bitter melon. Woo. All right, guys, that's it for me today. Today we're just talking about uh, tropical permaculture design strategies in the tropics. Specifically today we're doing high shade, mulching, and using chickens and keeping chickens as part of your system. I'm gonna go much more detail, especially in the chickens over time. Keep watching the vlog. If you are interested in what I'm doing, you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to the channel and share it with any relevant communities that you have. It'll really help me expand my reach. And my goal, guys, long term, I'm just telling you this up front, is I would love to be doing YouTube as like a primary kind of means of, not, not income per se, but my main kind of focus because I wanna be sharing the knowledge that I have, I have gained over time with you guys because once you kind of know how to do it, it's really, it's easy. Anyone can do this. Anyone can grow their own food. Anyone can produce their own compost. Anyone can raise chickens. This stuff's easy. This is our grandmothers and great grandmothers and all that. They are the ones that are doing this back in the wartime in World War II, World War I. And that was just required for everyone to live. And I'm not, I'm not talking bad on them, but if they can do it, you can do it, right? Anyone can do this stuff. And I want to encourage you and help you along your way. So I am here in the tropics, so I'm going to be focusing a lot on tropical permaculture gardening. So please know that if you guys are watching my videos and you're in the temperate climate, I'll try to give temperate, temperate climate kind of similarities and, and analogs and, or, or things to do instead if you're in the temperate climate. But just know that I am in a tropical climate and in permaculture, knowing your climate is very, very important. You can't apply everything. It's not a one size fits all thing. Permaculture is very specific to your site. And even within the tropics, my site right here is gonna be different than a site that's five minutes away. It's very, very specific to your site. So in the future, we'll also be doing more kind of permaculture design basics, how to, do, how to check out your site, how to figure out your sun angles, all that. We'll do all that kind of video in the future. If you wanna see that, please like and subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends because the more following I get, the more, the more excited I am to produce more. And I actually really do enjoy doing this. I didn't know if I would. Um, this little quarantine lockdown time was my time to explore it and see if I actually wanted to do this uh, on a regular basis. And I, and I do, I really, you know, the sitting at the computer and editing, that, that can sometimes be somewhat of a hassle, but honestly, I enjoy doing it. I, I, I do enjoy doing it. I don't enjoy being on the computer necessarily for that long, but. I enjoy the product and I enjoy knowing that I can be helping you guys uh, create your own future and create your world of abundance wherever you are. So that's it for me today. Hope you guys have enjoyed and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.